Well, again, if you're just now joining us, um, we will begin shortly. Unless you are in need of closed captioning, we ask that you attend via YouTube. The YouTube link is on your screen there. So we're asking everyone to go to YouTube unless you are in need of closed captioning, then we ask you to stay here in Zoom. Okay, everyone, let's go ahead and begin. Pleased to get things kicked off here for Black Minds Matter. Uh, this is the third version of this class that we've been able to do. We're very excited because we have a wonderful list of scholars who are gonna talk about the research they've been doing, as well as family members who've been directly affected by uh, police violence who are going to share not only their stories, but the linkages that we see between black lives and black minds. And going back to the very beginning, when we first started doing this class, we truly believe that black lives and black minds are intertwined. If one does not value the life, then they certainly will not value the mind. And that is a theme that you're gonna see throughout this, drawing parallels between what we see in policing and on the streets and what we see in schooling and in the classroom, and recognizing that there are two underlying themes that we see across both areas. First, that black minds and black bodies are undervalued. And the second, that they are overcriminalized and assumed to be dangerous, deviant, up to no good. And as a result, there is a way that black peoples are engaged that by both law enforcement and sometimes by educators as well, that communicates to them distrust, disdain, and disregard. Some concepts that we'll get to a little bit later. I'm Luke Wood, um, and I'm uh, proud to be serving as the co-host uh, or co-faculty, co-professor for this program, along with my wonderful colleague, Dr. Donna Y. Ford. Uh, Donna is a distinguished professor of education and human ecology um, and Kerwin Institute faculty affiliate at The Ohio State University's College of Education and Human Ecology. And you can see her Twitter handle there, at Donna Y. Ford. And as many of you know, I'm Luke Wood. I serve as the Dean's Distinguished Professor of Education at San Diego State and also Vice President for Student Affairs and Campus Diversity. And you can see my respective Twitter handle at Dr. Luke Wood. And we would ask that during these, these next five weeks that you continue to engage us with questions and comments using those handles at, with the hashtag Black Minds Matter. So, uh, please begin uh, reaching out with questions, comments, et cetera, and we will make sure that um, that we are being responsive to that and providing you with any um, resources or support that you might need. Ultimately, that's what this is all about, is helping to improve the ways that Black people, Black students uh, across every level of education, from preschool to doctor level education, are engaged by educators because we believe that there is a space for um, greater affirmation, greater validation, greater success, but that ultimately it begins with the educators who work with these students, not with the students themselves. Now, for those of you there's, uh, who are attending this for uh, the free continuing education units, you can go uh, and participate in that uh, via the CORE website. There's the link there that's in yellow. It's corelearning.org backslash product back black uh, backslash black dash minds dash matter and so there's essentially two ways to participate in this public series or public course so one is just to show up to the sessions that we have each week and to learn about different strategies and practices that can be successful in supporting black students and the parallels between that and what we see in policing and that is uh, completely fine and we hope that you will do that there are some, though, who would also like to, in addition, to earn uh, free continuing education units at no cost provided by CORE, which is an authorized provider of CEUs through ISET. And 
if you're interested in doing that, you go to that link, you click on enroll in this class, you complete the registration, and all you need to do is show that, that you watch the videos um, for each week and that you have done the readings. And uh, based upon completion of those things, you'll be able to receive uh, units uh, to demonstrate that you participated in what we believe is an incredibly important learning experience. And most of all, reminding you that the CEUs are again free, just like this course. We wanna begin by thanking our partner organizations. We'd like to extend a special thank you to them for their support of the development and delivery of Black Minds Matter. They include Race Mentoring, the California Community Colleges, Conscious Campus, the Education Trust West, the Ohio State University College of Education and Human Ecology, Diverse Issues in Higher Education, the Center for Organizational Responsibility and Advancement, ACPA College Student Educators International, No Queen Left Behind, the California State University um, Institute for Teaching and Learning, and AMEND, the African American Male Education Network and Development. And I should say that, um, again, this is the third time that we have taught uh, this class in this way. And several of these uh, sponsors have been with us since the very beginning. And essentially, as part of their sponsorship, what they have done is to help ensure that the word is out about Black Minds Matter, which we really appreciate. And as a result, we have, um, as of today, nearly 18,000 people who are registered to participate in this class. And many of you are logged in right now. And those who aren't, we believe, will go back and, and participate um, as they have in the past and watching the videos, participating in the readings, engaging in this community. So again, we just wanna thank our sponsors. Uh, this is just a, a map showing from the first two uh, Black Minds Matters uh, courses, individual registrants, site locations. What we've done historically is that we've had individuals register, and then we've also had live broadcast and replay broadcast sites throughout the country. Um, we've had over 10,000 people during the first Black Minds Matter who participated, another 10,000 people who participated in the second one. And that's when we were able to do things a little different. You can see a, a, a picture of me. Uh, on campus talking about the importance of our a pyramid of success, which we will, of course, come back to as part of this class. Uh, but we were able to be on campus and engage in, in a different way. Uh, in our new environment, the COVID environment, uh, we're able to do this because of the, the benefit of Zoom and technology, which allows us to connect. But I want to set the foreground of this with the recognition that we are in the midst, as many people have said, two pandemics, a health pandemic, COVID-19, and a racial pandemic, which has continued to sweep our country since its inception. But we have seen most recently in the high profile murders of George Floyd, Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor, Tony McDade, and far too many others. And while Black Minds Matter in its previous iterations focus on making those connections with prior cases such as Trayvon Martin, Michael Brown, Tamir Rice, Eric Garner, Oscar Grant III, um, we are now trying to make those same connections here in this class. But it all has to go back to the very, 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 very beginning. And the very beginning um, is in 2017 when we first offered the Black Minds Matter class, and we did so after an incident that took place in our hometown in San Diego, California, where a, a Ugandan refugee, as you can see on your left-hand side of your screen, Alfred Alongo, um, was killed. Alfred was a refugee from Uganda who came to the United States at the age of 12 with his family was, you know, refugees. They were seeking to escape a regime that wanted to kill them. He was a father, a husband, he worked in the food service industry, and he had hoped to open up his restaurant in the future. However, um, last, you know, when we began teaching the class several months before then, he had experienced the loss of one of his close friends. And a few days later, his sister noticed that he wasn't acting himself. And so being concerned for, for his safety, his family called uh, the police and asked them to bring a psychiatric response team. Unfortunately, when the police responded, they did not bring a psychiatric response team. 
And instead, they brought regular police officers who shot and killed Alfred um, at close range, mistaking what was a small vape machine for a gun. And anybody who has been able to see the footage of that event would know that it would be incredibly difficult to mistake the, a gun for what he had in his hand, unless there is an innate fear of, of black men that causes police officers to engage them in ways that assume that they're dangerous and that ignite fear within them. And unfortunately, we see similar things in the classroom. Well, what happened after the, the, the killing of Alfred was that our hometown of San Diego was embraced, em, 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 embroiled rather, in protests, marches, and rallies. And the African-American students in our PhD program were directly involved in, in actions. Um, and what we wanted to, to do was to show how what we see, again, on the street is similar to what we see in the classroom. And also on the right-hand side of your screen represents another um, important motivator for this work, which was the Education Trust West report focused on Black learners in California, but the report was called Black Minds Matter. And it's been since then, since we've been partnering with Ed Trust West, to really ensure that this notion that Black minds do indeed matter um, have been central to the work that we've been doing. Now, uh, for those of you who have participated in the past, you know that we always release a public syllabus, which has readings, it has our student learning outcomes, course prerequisites, and you can go and, and, and take a look at this. We sent it out via email. We'll make sure to continue, continue to send it out and make it available to you. Uh, and I'll just go through this very quickly. The course purpose, Black Minds Matter, is a public series that is designed to raise the national consciousness about issues facing Black students in education. The series intentionally addresses the pervasive undervaluing and criminalization of Black minds. Tangible solutions for promoting the learning development and success of Black students will be offered. There are two, for those of you who are, are take, doing the free CEUs, there's two books that we are asking people to um, engage, to read, to share. Um, and the first one is Black Minds Matter, Realizing the Brilliance, Dignity, and Morality of Black Males in Education. Um, this is a book that I, that I have um, authored. Uh, you can go and get the digital version. You can also get the imprint version. Uh, there's two things to keep in mind with this. The first is that all proceeds from this book from June to December are going to be donated to the Alfred Alongo Foundation. And so we encourage you to, to purchase this not only for your own um, edification, but also to support um, that foundation. In addition, every book that is bought through bookshop.org, um, they are separately donating to local Black bookstores um, in your own area. So if you buy this and you are in Atlanta, they will find Black bookstores in Atlanta and ensure that they're donating to those stores. And then the, the second book that we would recommend is Recruiting and Retaining Culturally Different Students in Gifted Education. This is a 2014 NAACP Image Award nominee for literature. It's written by my colleague, uh, Dr. Donna Y. Ford. And so we'd encourage you all to um, gain access to that. In addition, for each week, we have readings that we've identified um, that include what we would call required readings, which we encourage people to, uh, to participate in if they're taking the public series for fun. But if you're also doing it for CEUs, those would be required readings as well that we would want you to take a look at. Um, and you'll notice a, a familiar piece from uh, prior times that we've talked this class, Why Black Lives and Minds Matter from uh, Professor Tyrone Howard, who will be gracing us with his uh, presence today. And so you can see the readings for session one, session two, session three, session four, and session five. And so there's, there's different thematic elements that we'll talk about next week. And so we're, we're hoping that everyone will take the moment, engage these readings, and, and use it for their, again, using this time for personal edification. We also like to highlight that as part of this class this time, what we have done is to bring in families that have been directly affected by police violence, those who have uh, fallen at the hands of law enforcement. And we have brought in family members to talk about what those parallels look like, again, between policing and schooling. And they are, are, are guest speakers who are being incredibly gracious with their time, include uh, Michael Brown Sr., who is the father of Michael Brown Jr., Shantae Needham, who is the sister of Sandra Bland, 
Pamela Bingay, who is the mother of Alfred Alongo, and Gwen Carr, who is the mother of Eric Garner. And so um, each of our weeks, we're going to feature a different one of these individuals, and we're hoping that you will um, learn from their, their wisdom and from the experiences that, that they have had that they're being gracious again with sharing with us. In addition to that, we'll also have a number of wonderful uh, guest speakers who are professors of the highest order when it comes to the Black uh, student experience. Um, they include Dr. Tyrone Howard, Gl Dr. Gloria Ladson-Billings, Dr. William Smith, Dr. Chance Lewis, Dr. Ebony Zamani Gallagher, Dr. Ivory Tolson, Dr. Frank Harris, Dr. Andre Perry, Dr. Fred Bonner II. And if you're looking at this and wondering, wow, is this a highlight list? It is. These are amazing individuals who will be sharing their time with us uh, throughout this class. We also want to note that one of our guests, Shante Needham, is the sister of Sandra Bland. In fact, uh, we'll be talking with her today. And she, as part of, of this effort, has been, uh, and she owns a t-shirt company called No Queen Left Behind. If you go to Facebook, you can see at NQL um, behind. Um, you can go there and purchase Black Minds Matter shirts from her um, if you're interested in doing so. We hope that you will support her, support Black Minds Matter, and, and take the time to do so. Again, you just go to Facebook to No Queen Left Behind at that um, handle that you see there. And, and purchase shirts that help to visibly portray to people that we do believe that Black Minds Matter. In addition, um, our scholarship matters. Um, Ebony Zamani Gallagher and her team um, have the, their collection of shirts that they've done in prior years and they're making available as a special offering for those who might want them. Um, they're incredible. I have, I think, every single one of them. And we would encourage you to also go to OurScholarshipMatters.com if you're looking for um, a different selection. Either way, if you purchase shirts, if you don't purchase shirts, we just want people to be vocal and visible and demonstrating that Black Minds Matter. Now, on the docket today will be an, uh, two key individuals. The first is Dr. Tyrone Howard. And Dr. Howard has um, served as a professor, as a Black Minds professor um, before, and he is returning to us, and we're grateful for that. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and just introduce and read his bio now so that when we get to it, we can go engage right directly in that interview. But Dr. Tyrone C. Howard is professor in the Graduate School of Education and Information Studies at the University of California, Los Angeles. Dr. Howard is an endowed chair and inaugural director of the, new, of the UCLA Pritzker Center for uh, Strengthening Children and Families, which is a campus-wide consortium examining academic, mental health, and social-emotional experiences and challenges for California's most vulnerable youth populations. He's also the former associate dean for equity, diversity, and inclusion. Professor Howard's research examines culture, race, teaching, and learning in, in urban schools. He has authored more than 75 peer-reviewed journal articles, book chapters, and technical reports. And this bio probably isn't even up to date. My guess is it's 100 by now. Um, he is the author of a number of really critical books, but two that stand out uh, that I definitely recommend is Why Race and Culture Matters in Schools. And the second one is Black Mailed, Peril and Promise in the Education of African American Males. The, and you can see his respective Twitter handle there at the bottom. We hope that you will engage him. We also uh, have a conversation with Muhammad Abdi. Muhammad Abdi is a doctoral student um, at San Diego State University. And since the George Floyd incident, he has been in, um, in Minnesota engaging with people um, on the street and taking time to hear what their perspectives are around Black Lives Matter and Black Minds Matter. And you're going to be able to hear some of his interviews with people uh, regarding what they think we should be doing in terms of building up Black minds within our schools. And then, of course, we will have Shantae Needham uh, from No Queen Left Behind, who, in, who again is the sister of Sandra Bland. And she is going to be talking about um, not only her sister, but her own personal experience and some of the challenges that she has seen in school and what we can do to best support all of our students. And so uh, let's go ahead and jump in. 
Um, as we do, I want to begin with some really important framing uh, that we think is critical for the class. I'm going to do a very short talk here, and then I'll turn it over to Donna before we go into our guest speakers. But really, it, it deals with the notion that there are three primary concepts that we believe connect the, the Black student experience from preschool to doctoral level education. And those three themes are distrust, disdain, and disregard. Distrust, where we assume that Black students are dangerous, deviant, up to no good. Disdain, where we look at Black students and we see them as being lesser than, and we paint their, them, their families and their communities from a perspective that is deficit, that sees them as not having what they need to be successful. And then the third is disregard, where we make assumptions about their intelligence and we assume that they are academically inferior. And it's the linkages of each of those three themes, distrust, disdain, and disregard, that really create the Black student experience in education. And I'll be talking extensively throughout this series about distrust and assumptions of criminality and how that re uh, creates referrals, suspensions, expulsions, et cetera. And Donna will be spending a lot of time talking about uh, disregard as it relates to intelligence, gifted education, um, and lack of representation in gifted education, as well as overrepresentation in special education, and then collectively us, as well as our speakers, when we talk about disdain. But first, let's talk about disregard, and let's go back to the very, very beginning, and begin to really think about our students in early learning. So this is based upon a study that is coming out um, between um, Idara Essien, who is a an assistant professor in child and family development and myself, we, we co-author a number of different pieces together focused on black learners in early childhood education. And so what Adara and I have done, uh, or Professor Essie and I should say have done, is that we have through qualitative work, through, through eliciting narratives from the parents of black children in early childhood education, preschool, kindergarten, first grade, second grade, third grade, have, did, have identified really four primary ways that black children are engaged by educators. First, they are assumed to be troublemakers, to be dangerous, deviant, up to no good, even in early childhood education, even as early as preschool. Then because they are assumed to be bad, they are then hyper surveilled for wrongdoing, to assume that they're bad and then to monitor them to try to identify when they make mistakes. And then unlike when other children may make mistakes or even in times where they don't, they are singled out for punishment when other children are engaging in very similar behaviors. And then they are subjected to harsher punishments um, that are oftentimes more prolonged and um, convey a sense of, of disgust and disregard for them and their minds and their bodies. And so here are some quotes from the parents of black students, again, in early childhood education at the most formative years of schooling about what they say. And this is the first one around the first thing of assumed to be troublemakers. The teacher repeatedly described my seven-year-old child as aggressive because he put his all into winning at sports and games. I had to interject numerous times reminding the teacher that my child is competitive, not aggressive. Another parent said, my son started preschool when he was 18 months old. When we arrived for the conference, this is a parent-teacher conference, we sat down expecting to hear about our son making new friends, playing and doing art. Instead, we spent the next 45 minutes hearing that our son was physical and aggressive. We heard that when he got frustrated, that he put his hands on people. We heard that he was very busy. These were things she wanted to make us aware of. I couldn't help but wonder, is this accurate? Did his teacher like him? Why not? When I think back to that conference, I do not recall a single positive remark. And so these are, um, these are narratives from the parents of Black children. And this piece um, is actually coming out very soon. It's titled Suspected, Surveilled, Singled Out, and Sentenced. Again, su su Suspected, Surveilled, Singled Out, and Sentenced. And it's coming out in the Journal of Negro Education. Here's some more quotes from parents. It was another school year when one teacher talked, uh, uh, when we talked to another teacher during a parent conference night. The teacher was saying how well our child was doing and was surprised. I asked her why. 
She said that she thought my daughter was going to wind up being a troublemaker for the class. I asked her why she would think that, and she said that some of the students would misbehave sometimes, mostly from our neighborhood. Another parent said, my son had transferred into a predominantly white uh, school for third grade. One of the teachers asked him how he was liking the school. When my son told him that he was liking the school so far, the teacher proceeded to tell him that he wouldn't have to watch over his shoulder because there was not a lot of students who looked like him there. This implied that students who looked like my son, who's black, caused problems and would be a cause for concern. Again, all these notions of assuming that black students are troublemakers. Then beyond being assumption of being a troublemaker, we see that black students are then hyper surveilled for wrongdoing. One parent said, I volunteered in my preschool classroom. The teacher approached me and tells me, you need to watch out for Jamal. He held the scissors the other day and started swinging them at the other students. The teacher made it seem that Jamal was a villain or a criminal for pretending to use the scissors incorrectly. While she was saying, watch out, so while this was happening, Johnny, a white boy in the, in the class, held the scissors and did the same thing as what Jamal had done. The teacher said in a very nice tone, Johnny, is that the right thing to do? And then carried on to the next lesson. And you can see how that, that treatment is very different. Another parent said, in kindergarten, my son was sent home literally every day with notes, petty things. He untied his shoes during story time. He accidentally scratched the kid with his fingernails. Other parents have said, my son's teacher yelled at my son for spilling a little paint. And mind you, it's washable paint. Other kids spilled it too, but it doesn't bother them, only when the black kids do it. And you can see that they're being singled out in a way that is different from other children. When my son was in preschool, a predominantly white school, he constantly would get calls home from school saying he was hitting other students. The issue was that in each occurrence, the teacher or director would say that he only hit in defense. He was being hit and would in turn hit the child back, but he was the one who was getting calls home. As you can see, differential treatment here. The other students who were doing the initial hitting did not get calls home and were not treated like a nuisance. They even went as far as threatening to kick my son out of preschool for hitting even though they conceded that he was never the one who hit first. Other parents have talked about these same patterns being singled out. Oh, in first grade, my son regularly sent home, was sent home with notes regarding minor infractions. So minor things he was getting notes home from. When I questioned him, he mentioned how three or four other students later discovered they were white, were also doing the same things. They didn't get into trouble. Here's another example of how students can even be in a group and how, how a black child can still be singled out. An incident happened where a Caucasian kid pointed out a rainbow and three other kids looked at it. I remember the main administrator specifically naming and shaming our son. Our son is quiet and tends to follow the crowd. He can get mouthy when questioned, but what kid does it when he's singled out when four other kids seem to get a pass? It doesn't help the situation, but I can't blame him. That seems unfair. And then we also want to think about um, how the punishments can be even harsher. When he is disciplined, it seems harsher and more stern than his non-colored counterparts who participated in the same events. There appears to be some fear from the administration, despite him being into Minecraft and generally being a very well-mannered kid. Of course, they see him through the lens that he's a danger because they're conditioned to believe he's a danger. And so this last set of quotes also helps to further inform how black children can be treated in a way that is more harsher. My son's first grade teacher would call home with every little infraction. Some of the punishments were often severe for even a small thing and didn't match the crime, such as turning around in his seat one time would result in the whole day being marked as bad. Some of the behavior issues that were written about would happen one time and the teacher would prolong the punishment instead of dealing with it and then moving on. Another parent said, my child was in second grade and his teacher was an older teacher. The teacher made a joke and uh, my, my, the child made a joke and his teacher made him cry. She said, second grade is no place for jokes. jokes. She then told another teacher that he is a clown, a class clown. And she made him stand in front of the class, including the other teacher and another associate. And she kept it up and made him cry. After making him, him cry, she also yelled at him. 
So with this, what we see is this, that there are some indicators of criminalization that every educator, every parent, every person who cares about black minds will watch out for and look out for. Those four patterns essentially uh, break down into these different elements, these indicators. So what are the indicators of black criminalization? What are those indicators? First, assuming. Assume that your child is a troublemaker. And this is written in context for parents, but it has direct applicability to teachers to look at these patterns as well. So the first one is assuming that my child is a troublemaker. The second one is referring, referring my, to my child with criminalized terms, talking about them as being bad or aggressive or hyper or misbehaving or physical or defiant or any type of label. And what we know is this, is that once a child is labeled, that that label continues with them throughout the rest of their educational experience. You peg a child as bad in kindergarten for doing things that a normal young kid would do, and then that kid is viewed as the bad kid, not just in kindergarten, but in first grade, second grade, third grade, because those messages carry on. Spending, spending time watching my child for wrongdoing. So monitoring them, hyper surveilling them, and then singling them, singling them out. Single my child out for punishment, even when they do the same thing as other children. But also giving harsher punishments, giving my child harsher punishments, such as restrictions of recess, suspensions, expulsions, referrals, but harsher punishments. So something that one child does may get a referral. When it's a black child, they get a suspension. Um, so you can see that there's a differential treatment. Disciplining, immediately disciplining my child for perceived wrongdoing. So being very quick to discipline rather than um, trying to understand the situation and what occurred when other children, the response is to assume that, hey, they're young, they're learning, um, let's provide them, a, let's find out what happened. But that is not the same thing that's, that is rendered to our black children. Disciplining them, immediately disciplining my child for perceived wrongdoing, presuming that my child is the cause of a problem they, when they tell their teacher that the other children have treated them poorly. This is a really big one, this one of presumption. It's what we call reverse causality. It, it's when a, a black child goes to their teacher and says, hey, this is happening to me. And the teacher's response isn't to say, what is going on, investigating, how can they support the child? Instead, the teacher's response is to say, well, what did you do to cause this to occur? So again, presuming that my child is the cause of a problem when they tell their teacher that other children have treated them poorly, identifying mistakenly identifying my child as the one who did wrong when they did not, because again, this assumption going back up to the very beginning is that they're troublemakers. And then lastly, suggesting that my child has a behavioral disorder. So these are all, again, works um, and that I've done with my colleague, Dr. Idara Essien, and we would encourage you to check some of them out. One of her readings is in the public course syllabus, and I'll continue to send others out as it relates to this topic. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to my colleague, Donna Ford, who's going to talk a little bit about uh, what it means to think about Black intelligence in the context of gifted education, and we'll go from there. Again, thank you for being here, and just remember that Black minds matter. Well, Dr. Wood, thank you for inviting me to be a co-host and um, understanding the value of also focusing on um, gifted education or, or gifted and talented education, which I may call GATE uh, later on. This entire course is phenomenal and it is so needed um, in both of these pandemics, but especially the racial pandemics. So I can't say enough about how important Black minds do indeed matter. So thank you, Dr. Wood. I want to talk about the school to prison pipeline, in particular, black students in equitable, and I'm stressing that, I'm screaming that, underrepresentation in gifted and talented education. And um, for more information, you can reach me at 4.255 at osu.edu. Uh, this is one of my favorite quotes by the United Negro College Fund, and it says, a mind is a terrible thing to waste. I modified it and not to negate how important that one is, but I grew up grew up believing that, which is why I think I've been, you know, relatively successful. But this one says, by me, a mind is a terrible thing 
to erase, which again, I cannot emphasize, relates to what Dr. Luke has organized and for the third time, Black Minds Matter. Uh, when it comes to the achievement gap, or you might use opportunity gap, expectation gap, et cetera, you know, terminology aside, we have issues with deficit thinking too often among some educators who are primarily white and female. So we have to address cultural incompetence. We have to address uh, deficit thinking because it does contribute to the under referral of black students in GATE, the over referral of black students for special education, in particular, the high incidence areas. And that is not, um, that, not the low incidence areas, but the high incidence areas. And um, as Dr. Luke and Dr. Harris write about often, it contributes to the over referral of black students for suspension and expulsion, which is so very subjective. So combined or alone, these contribute to the achievement gap, dropout, push out, whichever term you want to use, both, and the prison pipeline. So I have this phrase that I use, which says, the less we know about others, the more we make up. And that is the vicious cycle of deficit thinking. The less we know about Black students, the more we make up. <clears throat> Excuse me. The less we know about Black males, the more we make up prison, I'm sorry, school to prison pipeline. <coughs> Excuse me. I just had to show this picture and it stresses that racial profiling starts early. There's a book called Convicted in the Womb and I will never forget reading it and um, the author's experience. And this is what I think about when I see this little baby in this little cart um, and this police officer, you know, sitting next to him. It's a poignant ex uh, example of how racial profiling begins so early. In my work, I look at the underrepresentation again, of black students in GATE. Uh, so, but I also am concerned about Hispanic students. I just want to uh, let you know that Hispanic students are 16% of gifted programs, but to be equitable, they should be at least 20% of our gifted programs in the U.S. And then Black students are 10% of gifted programs, but they should be 15.2%. So a huge discrepancy. Now, I don't like to play. Um, oppression Olympics, but look at um, Asian students. They're 5% of our schools, but 10% of gifted programs. Black students are 19% of our schools, but only 10% of gifted programs. And that should stand out to you as being really uh, problematic and inequitable. And it shows that we have work to do. So when you, when you look at um, thinking about Black minds matter, when you look at Black students not being identified as gifted, and most of them unidentified will be Black males, then we have to um, change those numbers and understand um, that Black minds do matter, but our children um, are, are wasting away in our schools. So annually, over annually, over 250,000 Black students should be identified as gifted, but they are not. And that is tragic. Black students, in terms of gifted education, again, we can look at, you know, in my opinion, who is opening doors, who's closing doors, and who is holding the key, as illustrated in this picture. So, um, underrepresentation is intentional and unintentional. 
But I want to argue, and I will argue, and I have argued, that most of under underrepresentation is intentional. It is explicit bias, not just implicit bias. The number one reason for underrepresentation is that teachers, counselors, administrators, but period, educators are under referring black students. I want you to hear this, and this is why I changed the color and put those asterisks there. That is the number one reason. Then we can look at test bias and why our test was chosen, et cetera. We can look at policies and procedures. We can look at the lack of administrator accountability in terms of too many administrators, in my experiences, um, over the years are afraid to take on the status quo who really in education are white females. There are also concerns about isolation and alienation um, that uh, is felt by black students and their families. And the concern is legitimate. You don't wanna be by yourself. So, um, you, you have no friends, you have no social life. So it's legitimate and more, but I, I'm gonna say it again. The number one reason is predominantly white female educators are not referring black students for get programs, even when they have the same profile as their white colleagues or the white peers. So gifted education, I wanna stress, must not be discounted or considered a footnote or an afterthought in the school to prison pipeline. The dialogue and initiative initiatives must include gifted um, education. Under identification, under being underserved and means you are being miseducated or black children are being miseducated. It contributes to underachievement, it contributes to disengagement, as well as emotional and behavioral issues. Our children didn't come to school necessarily like this, but those with so much potential um, end up being um, underserved and misidentified and miseducated, and that is unfortunate. A mind is a terrible thing to waste and erase. In gifted education, there are five areas that are formally recognized. Intellectual is the premier um, area that families tend to want. And let me say exclusively um, that white uh, high income families see this as a badge of honor that their child is identified as intellectually gifted. IQ tests, which are biased. They're biased linguistically and they're biased socially and they're biased culturally. We have specific academics, which is the core content areas. And unfortunately, our students are underrepresented or underreferred in that area as well. The third area is creativity. Now, this is where you will see um, more representation of Black students in gifted programs, creativity. And E. Paul Torrance, he's passed away a long time ago, considered the father of creativity, said that Black children, especially if they live in low-income areas, are the most creative of all groups. I know that needs to be unpacked, but I'm only trying to do an overview. But look up the work, work of E. Paul uh, Torres. Then we have vision performing arts. There's usually not a problem with our Black students being identified in that area as well. Next, or finally, we have leadership. And this is, leadership is rarely, is if ever, let me, let me say it again. Leadership is rarely, if ever, given attention in schools. However, it's tragic for our Black students who have so many gifts and talents, but then when there is not channeled, some, not all, use those gifts and talents in socially 
unacceptable ways. And my classic example would be them becoming gang leaders. So if you look at the characteristics of um, leaders, leaders or leadership, uh, our gang leaders fit that. And we have lost thousands and thousands of Black students who should have been identified as gifted. And they uh, probably would not have ended up um, in this area of leadership with it being socially unacceptable. So going toward the end, my work has been about bridging. What do we know about urban education or culturally responsive education and um, anti-racist education in terms of academic development and needs, cognitive, affective, psych psychological, et cetera. And then I bridge what is being um, discussed in gifted education um, and often refute some of it, but I want that to be merged with those same areas. So Donna, as I said in a lot of sessions, Donna comes from an urban area. Uh, I guess I could say, fortunately, I was identified as gifted. So Donna is gifted and black, not or, and I need uh, support in terms of merging those two areas, not one or the other. So this last, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, this slide here um, depicts um, these areas being uh, merged. So it's both, what are we doing in gifted education and advanced placement? And I cannot say enough that we have to merge those two in order to disrupt, to disrupt the school to prison pipeline with gifted education as one focus right now. So our, our goal should be to recruit and retain black students in gifted education through a lens of equity with a focus on potential and talent development. Um, looking at relationships, as well as creating strong, positive um, expectations. So I'll end with this chart here. I'm not gonna go over the four areas, but I wanna say, I wanna end on the last two. And that is too many black students, children in the schools as question marks and exclamation points, but they leave school as periods. And then I really like the quote from Reverend Dr. Joseph Lowry. In 2005, I saw it on C-SPAN where he said, we must be just as diligent about closing the achievement gap as we were about creating it. Now, I'm not a mind reader, but when I hear that quote, when I read that quote, it, the we was white professionals white educators. Thank you. Well, thank you for that, uh, Dr. Ford. I, I think that's um, really, really helpful context and I think really good for, for those who are on this um, to hear. Now, can you go a little bit deeper into that, that statement, too many Black children enter schools as question marks and exclamation points, too many leave school as periods. What, what does that mean to you? Uh, it means to me that I think many of us Black parents do the best we can to prepare our children to be ready for school, but with deficit thinking and racism and anti-Blackness, uh, which contributes to, as said earlier, special education over-representation referrals and uh, over disciplinary um, actions, which are very subjective, our students just start giving up. They're like, I can't do anything right in school. And the teachers don't like me. And they're misplaced in special ed. And they, their education is suspended as your work shows. And so, you know, if they might come to school excited, but it does not take long for them to disengage and no longer 
care about school. So some people call it, for example, the second grade syndrome, I mean, a second grade or third or fourth grade syndrome where black students just give up. And you can look at like school pictures, which I've done over, you know, the years and you will see like they're happy in kindergarten and that smile starts to change into a frown, you know, smile turns into a frown not too long after our students uh, enter school. So periods means um, just no energy, no excitement, no regard for learning. And I'm sorry, that was a long response, but that's what that quote means to me. That's what that statement means to me. Well, thank you again for, for sharing um, your work. And each session that we have, uh, both of us will be uh, sharing our work like we did uh, this time, of course, really connecting two key themes which we think are important, that Black children, Black learners at all levels are criminalized in their educational experience, and they're assumed to be less capable academically, which results in their overplacement at times in special education and underplacement at times in gifted and talented education. And so we will continue to explore what this look, looks like, how it manifests, and ultimately what we can do about it. Uh, at this point, what we're going to do is transition to a conversation now with a colleague of ours, a great colleague, Dr. Tyrone Howard. And so Dr. Howard is a professor at the University of California, Los Angeles, and he's an endowed chair there who does extensive research focused on Black boys and men in particular in education. And as many of you might remember, he has also been um, on Black Minds Matter before um, in prior years. Appreciate you having me, Luke. Uh, also want to say a big shout out to Donna Ford. I know she's been working with you on this endeavor, but I got lots of mad respect and love for you all for leading the charge on this important topic. So appreciate you having me in. Appreciate it. Um, and again, thank you for, for joining us. What we'd like to do is turn to you and really just have you talk a little bit about the work that you're doing first, and then we'll, we'll follow up with some questions that, that we had for you because we obviously were looking very much looking forward to this conversation. So really the, the floor is yours. Appreciate that, Luke. So what I'll do is just, just give a, a few talking points to try to set the, the, the context for how and why and where I do the work as it pertains to Black Minds. And I appreciate you all providing this format because there's such a overlap, such a, an alignment, if you will, between the Black Lives Matter movement as it pertains to police brutality and the Black Minds Matter movement as it pertains to what I would argue is brutality that happens to our children in schools all across this country. And so I think the fact that you're engaging some folks around this is important, but I always preface by saying the fact that I do this work and have done this work like you do for a long time, it's centered on the fact that I have a community of folks who I'm, I'm with on a regular basis. And some of the amazing scholars that I work with at UCLA and the, and the, and the Black Men Institute, we've been grappling with these topics for, for decades and understanding the, the nexus between gender and race and, and, and socioeconomic status where it comes to issues of homelessness, where it comes to the issues of uh, black women, black men, uh, trying to understand the role of community engagement with regard to what happens in K-12 schools, looking at school suspensions, uh, looking at access to higher education, all these factors that really kind of shape my thinking in a lot of ways because we can only do this work, I think, when we're in concert with other uh, like-minded folks. And again, the beautiful, I think, advantage to being on a campus like UCLA is you have some amazing scholars who are pushing, who are thinking, who are challenging about how we do this work better. And I would not be able to do the work that I do were it not for them. But one of the things that we do, not only in these spaces, but in some of the spaces that in my, in my class I teach, we engage in work that are race-related. And we don't shy away from race-related uh, types of works because we think that for, for you know, a long time, and you know this, Luke, uh, this, 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 the, the work on race and Black folk in particular has oftentimes been marginalized, uh, or we have been pathologized, or we have been essentially silenced. And so we, we delve into the work done on Black people, by Black people. Uh, we engage in different frameworks that help us to understand sort of the nexus, again, of where teacher education, higher education, uh, poverty, uh, all these different areas of where race come into play and its impact on Black folks, because when we talk about Black minds mattering in schools, uh, we need to be not only consumers of this 
knowledge and literature, I believe, but I think we also need to be producers of it as well. And folks yeah. like yourself, you've been at the forefront of this work for a while, helping us to begin to rethink, <laughs> reframe, and understand our histories, our stories, our struggles, our triumphs, and unfortunately, as you well know, Luke, our, tra our tragedies uh, from yeah. our lens and our standpoint. And that's an important part of how we think about this work in my courses, uh, in my individual meetings with students or in our center's work is thinking about the work. And one of the things we always say is whose narrative is being told and who's telling the narrative. And yeah. that's, that's what drives this work for us in a lot of ways. One of the things I think we have to do though, Luke, as you know this, is that I think we always need to situate our work within, within, uh, within a historical context. And I think we have been fortunate enough to have some giant intellectuals who have told us for, for centuries that Black minds matter. When you think about Mary McLeod Bethune, uh, where she was fighting, pushing, advocating for Black students' education when folks' lives were at risk, uh, where Black folks were being lynched, uh, where Black folks were not being recognized as, as, as full citizens because of the sort of the, the nature of white supremacy. Uh, Anna Julia Cooper was an, another early pioneer who was fighting, advocating, uh, for the brilliance of Black people, Black education, Black minds, and, and, and is a name that we must always sort of uh, enter when we talk about these issues around Black minds matter. And then, of course, Carter G. Woodson uh, yeah. is another one who, who fought and advocated for us to do this work. So I always think that for even young scholars today, practitioners, you have to know the works of these folks because they were the ones who really set what I would argue is the intellectual foundation of helping us to understand that it was okay to advocate for black minds, that they were unapologetic in advocating for black minds, and that they were very intentional in saying that black lives, black minds needed to be prioritized, heard, and understood. So I think understand that that historical context is critical if we're going to do this work in the right way, because we're not the first ones to do this. Uh, we only do this because we stand on the intellectual shoulders, if you will, of folks like, you know, McLeod Bethune, uh, Anna Julia Cooper and Carter G. Woodson, who are not oftentimes referenced to the degree I wish that we would reference in, in the work that we see contemporary scholars doing. So I want to talk about just a few things real quick in terms of where some of the current work I've been doing. Then we kind of open up to more of a back and forth because recently my, my colleague and I, Pedro Naguera, were part of a team where we looked at issues around Black youth in LA County. And the reason why we were looking at Black youth in LA County is because like many other parts of the West Coast at least, uh, black folks, black students tend to be overlooked, in my opinion. And when you're overlooked, you're typically underserved. Uh, because of the demographic shift we've seen on the West Coast, uh, while the number of black students from a percentage standpoint is low, the, the raw numbers are still important in terms of seeing tens of thousands of black students in cities like Los Angeles, cities like yours in San Diego, cities like uh, you know Oakland, California, San Francisco. And we were, we were curious about how could we put an unapologetic spotlight on black students? Uh, and we frame this around the fact that black students are still in the state in large numbers, but we wanted to look specifically in the county. But one of the things, Luke, that we were really intrigued by is the fact that so much in our opinion of what is happening in schools with black folks is that we are expecting schools to basically fix it all. And so what we did in this report beyond the schoolhouse, we said that when you look at the magnitude of the effects of race and racism on black folks, that schools, while they do play a part of the solution and let's be clear, have been part of the problem, but in many ways, they are not the culprits of the entire set of factors that black folks face. So for us, this report really got at issues of race and place and space to look at a host of issues beyond school uh, because we know for lots of Black youth, before they even step foot in schools, they've already had structural disadvantage that's been plaguing them from day one. Issues that are tied to environment, issues tied to mental health, uh, access to affordable housing, access to quality foods. Uh, these factors, you know, have a, have a notable impact on the, the, the overall health and well-being of Black minds, Black bodies. And so for us to think about a real realistic solution, we're going to have to think differently, I believe, and I think this COVID-19 pandemic has only uh, really exacerbated that, that we have to look at the, the, the inequities that exist in health, uh, access to health, access to, to medical care, uh, because all these things are going to shape the way that we show up and represent schools. And I've always said that despite all these challenges that Black students face, the manner that we still show up and prove and demonstrate our intellect in light of these obstacles is nothing short of amazing in my mind. Because when you look at data point after data point after data point, 
it doesn't always bode well for us as black folks. And so while I don't think it speaks to our pathology, I think it speaks to our uncanny determination, sheer will and resilience to be the best we can be in light of some real, real daunting circumstances. And so I won't go into too many details there, but I mentioned that report because now what I'm starting to look at is more ecological factors that shape black folks, uh, mm -hmm. looking at some of the, the, the epidemiological factors that are shaping black folks. Uh, when you look at cases of what happened in Flint, Michigan and Compton, California, lead-based, not paint, but lead-based water uh, that has some detrimental effects on Black folks. So the very manner in which we serve Black folks as a nation has always been fraught with major league challenges. And in many ways, I would argue that it's no different today and schools are just one byproduct of that. And so we go on to talk about this recent report that came out from the Casey Foundation, which I would really recommend folks take a look at. Uh, it's 2020 Kids Count Data Book, which again, looks at issues, not just in education, but looks at economic well-being, looks at health well-being, and looks at overall family factors. And what we always talk about when, when we work with this kind of data in our centers that look, you've got to look at these data with a critical eye, not, not one wherein you look at the problem being black children and black folks, but looking at systems that have failed black children and black folks, systems that continue to undermine black children and black folks, systems that have never humanized black children and black folks, and a system that has really deculturalized black children and black folks. And so part of what we do is because we're in research spaces is try to unpack, understand data, uh, critique that data, try to decipher through the data, try to see what narrative again is being told and who's telling that narrative. And so these kind of data points are important for us to think and look holistically, because I maintain that again, while we put pressure and we must put pressure on schools to get this right, we also must put pressure on city agencies, county agencies, state agencies, and even at the federal government level to begin to unpack some of the structural disadvantages that are steeped in racist practices and racist policies that we have been railing against for, for a very long time. So to that end, I'll just say, I think about this in terms of, you know, the kind of school-induced racial trauma that, that, that Black students oftentimes encounter. And that school-induced racial trauma is, is, is deep and wide, and it, it, it manifests itself in a lot of different ways. And some of the areas that my work has talked about this, like yours, Luke, again, like Donna's too, is that there's just this outright abuse, violence, and neglect that happens to Black bodies and Black minds in schools. And so I raise this because it's important for us to remember you know, while we've been having these conversations about trauma, uh, I am a little bit concerned that the way that trauma gets sort of talked about and positioned, it's like trauma comes from black families, trauma only happens in black homes, trauma happens in black communities. So therefore you all need to fix your neighborhoods, fix your homes, fix your families, and the trauma will be gone. But I'm, I'm very clear about this, that trauma is also uh, induced in schools. Sometimes children come from very much, very intact families, very intact communities, very intact households, and the trauma that they experience is initiated and sustained and enhanced in the very places that claim to support them, which are classrooms and which are schools. And so that school-induced trauma, I think, needs to be part of our paradigm where we look at the ways in which Black bodies are oftentimes punished uh, physically, literally punished physically in ways that nobody else's uh, bodies are. Uh, I think when you look at curriculum violence, as Rich Milner's talked about, where the very kinds of uh, uh, curriculum that our students are exposed to doesn't look like them, doesn't sound like them, doesn't speak to their history uh, or their, 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 their experiences. And so I think we have to begin to unpack curriculum and look at the kind of racial trauma that school curriculum does to our students. And then you and myself and Frank, you know, we were part of this, this, this Get Out report, which looked at the kind of violence and trauma that comes from our student by way of suspensions and expulsions, which continues to have a disproportionate impact on Black bodies, more so than anybody else. And that's an, an important part of how we see racial trauma being manifested in schools. And then one of the fourth areas that I begin to look at, because it's more subtle, but I think it's as equally as damaging, is this no rigor, no care, where oftentimes where Black students are in classrooms, and there's this expectation that they just won't learn. There's this belief that they don't want to be challenged. There's this expectation that I don't need to challenge them. So some teachers who, in their minds, are very well-intentioned teachers will basically allow students to fail by not challenging them, by not having any rigor in their classroom. In some cases, not doing anything that even closely resembles teaching. So we've been talking about these Karens in our, our, our communities. I think we have to recognize the Karens that are in classrooms that would claim up and down that they love black children, but don't hold any kind of high standards to themselves to teach black children, 
don't take the time to prepare, prepare and plan to help uh, black students be at their best. And they need to be called on the carpet because they're equally as damaging, despite the fact they may come across as, as liberal and loving and nice, but the effects of what they do is deeply, deeply disturbing. So those are just some of the issues that I continue to be intrigued by outside the classroom, uh, in the classroom, uh, uh, where we begin to see that black children still manifest uncanny brilliance, uh, unbridled intellect, even amongst some of the more challenging and oftentimes racially hostile environments. Uh, and so I think we've got to do a better job of holding those other sectors available that continue to point the finger at us, but yet don't point that finger at themselves in the way that they should. And so I think about this quote oftentimes by, by, by W.E.B. Du Bois, who says the system cannot fail those it was never meant to protect. And that becomes one of the, the bigger things I think about is that I wonder if we're pushing and trying to hold a system accountable that never saw the humanity in us, never wanted us to have these opportunities, never saw us as an inclusive part of this community. Uh, but I think about the fact that, you know, these institutions and structures change when there's pressure on the outside pushing in and on the inside pushing out. So uh, those are some things that come to mind. Those are some of my contemporary thoughts. And so uh, I'll stop it right there. Let's kind of jump into some 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 questions that you probably have for me. Yeah, absolutely. Wow, that was, as always, um, very powerful. You talk about these different elements of, of school-induced trauma. In what way do you see the parallels between those? Because you talked about abuse, uh, curricular violence, uh, being pushed out of the classrooms, no rigor, no care. Do you see a connection between what takes place there in education and what we're seeing on the streets with issues such as, you know, George, the murder of George Floyd, uh, Sandra Bland and so many others. No doubt, there's an obvious connection. So when you think about the violence that happens on streets that results in the death of individuals such as George Floyd and again, um, uh, Breonna Taylor, I think what you see are innocent black lives uh, that are just snuffed out uh, and there's no accountability and there's no uh, effort to, to see the humanity in folks who are, who are trying to be their best selves. Same thing happens in, in schools more than we want to recognize that you have innocent black children who come to school uh, expecting to be given the best that teachers have, but it's, 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 it's the kind of violence that they encounter curricularly, it's the violence that they encounter in terms of exclusion, it's the violence that they encounter when it comes to being uh, not seen and not heard. And some folks might say that's a big, big jump to kind of compare what happens with police brutality to what happens in the classroom. Uh, I would argue that one, is, a, is an immediate death when we talk about George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, but the other is a slow, long, hard death when you think about it. The ways in which we are essentially seeing the, the life out of our children's potential just being squeezed out year in, year out, when kids tell us that teachers don't see the best in them, when students tell us that teachers uh, frequently see them as a problem, when, when our children come to us and say that they feel like they can't be their authentic selves, when children come to us and say they don't want to go to school because they don't feel like they're being recognized, all those factors are, are essentially seeping the life out of the, 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 the dreams, the hopes, and the aspirations of our children. So, And at the end of the day, just like the police, there's no accountability. Uh, oftentimes, there's no punishment. And teachers get away with the same kind of educational neglect, educational malfeasance, and there's no accountability. There's no punishment. And we oftentimes know who the teachers are who commit these, these acts against our children, much in the way like police officers know who the officers are who commit these crimes, but they look the other way. So I maintain that while we have to hold those individuals accountable who are committing the infractions, equally culpable to me, Luke, are the folks who know about it, who see it every day, and who don't report on it. To me, they are equally as culpable because they stand by and watch the kind of mistreatment and neglect of our children. Yeah, you know, it's funny you say that. I, I saw a quote someplace where it said, if there are um, 100 good cops and then 10 bad cops and the good cops don't say anything about the bad cops, then there's 110 bad cops, <laughs> right? And that's, right? And that's how you have to think of it. You talk about this, you, you mentioned a Karen in the classroom. What does a mm -hmm. Karen look like in the classroom? And what do we, what do, we do about it? Yeah, so we've all seen Karens in the classroom. Let's be frank, some of our children had Karens in the classroom because here's the thing, here's how we get seduced and here's how we get sort of lulled to sleep by the Karens who are in our classroom. The Karens in our classrooms will come, 
on the first day of class and they'll meet us and they'll greet us and they'll say nice things and they'll smile and they'll say all the pleasantries that we think that we want to hear our children receive from their teachers. Uh, so you would never in a million years think that this Karen is racist. You would never think that she would treat students unfairly. You would never think that she would somehow punish kids in a way that is not uh, sort of, you know, uh, equitable. But then when you start to peel back the layers and you talk to some of the black children who are in these classrooms, they talk about never being called upon to answer questions in the classroom. They, they talk about oftentimes being framed as culprits the minute something goes wrong in the classroom. They talk about being sick. They talk about being labeled as being too loud and too opinionated in the classroom. They talk about never being selected to be a leader of anything. So what they do is the same kinds of acts that we oftentimes will uh, criticize these more uh, uh, explicitly racist teachers do, but they do it in ways that are very subtle, um, that are oftentimes sort of beneath the surface. But you talk to enough black children, they will tell you in a heartbeat, yeah, she's nice to those kids, but she's never yeah. nice to us. Or she talks to you differently when your parents are around. Or she always says, you know, good job when these kids say something, but she never says good job when I say something. Or we were both messing up, but she only says something to me. And there are countless examples of the Karens in the classroom. And here's the thing, if you were to ever call them on it, they would, they would literally, and we've seen this, bust into tears and say, I would never treat a child that way because I love all children. I don't even think about them as black children. I see them all as the same because the Karen in the classroom tends to operate from a colorblind standpoint, tends to think that race and racism are not real. And they tend to think of themselves in many ways as doing a favor uh, for black children because she's essentially in their presence. Mm. And that's, that's difficult because our children spend so much time um, in relationships with these teachers. So there's such an opportunity for them to do so much, you know, a lot of damage. One of the things that has been a very odd thing that I've heard come out of this current time we live in with COVID is I've heard from a lot of parents of black children, how they feel like their child's confidence is coming back, mm -hmm. that their child is more self-assured that they uh, are more focused that they're that that things that have been stripped from them, particularly around their their confidence in themselves, is coming back. And I mm -hmm. kind of almost feel like some of that might be because they're not in classrooms in the same way as they were before to be targeted. And I know that there's a lot of bad things that have come with COVID, of course, of course, unfortunate loss of life being first and foremost. But I think that one of the of the maybe maybe for some families at least the silver lining has been that they haven't been in a place to be targeted. Yeah, no, I think you're, you're onto something with that, Luke, because here's what we know, that the data from the National Association of Homeschools has shown that Black parents were doing more homeschooling prior to COVID than any other ethnic and racial group. So I think it speaks to the fact that for whatever reason, and we know what those reasons are, Black parents were feeling as if they could do a better job educating their children than schools could. So we saw that trend happening pre-COVID. And now during COVID, you're spot on. I think what you are hearing many parents say is that, wow, now all of a sudden my, my, my son or my daughter has a, a sort of a, an added sense of confidence or an extra way of sort of feeling good about who they are and what they do because they're not being subjected to the daily microaggressions, which we know black children are more likely to experience every single day, more so than any other group of kids are. And, you know, it's funny, I talked to a group of high school students, black students, young black males who I work with here in Los Angeles, and they were very adamant and clear with me that they had no wish or desire to go back to school because they felt like they did a better job teaching themselves than their teachers did. And I think mm -hmm. the more we collect data from black students to hear what they think and feel about wanting to go back to school, the more we hear from black parents and caregivers about what they think and feel about sending their children back to school, I think you'll find some of what you just spoke to is that, you know what, I'm not targeted by teachers. And in, in many integrated schools, so let's go one step further, where some black children are one of the only or some of the few black children, those are oftentimes even more racially hostile because in those spaces, they are quickly identified as a problem. They're seen as outsiders. They're looked at as problems. And so I would maintain if you begin to really unpack the nexus of race and socioeconomic status, where we have black folks who send their children to these middle class and upper middle class schools, that you may have children even more uh, inclined to not want to go back because they know what those spaces feel 
feel like. My only concern on this though, Luke, is that the younger our kids are sometime at four and five and six years old, they may not always have the language to articulate what they're feeling, but I think if we know our children enough and we spend more time in those classrooms, we'll begin to pick up on some of the racial hostility that they're oftentimes encountering. So how do parents of those younger children identify? I know that one of the things that I've done with my kids, particularly as they've been going through early childhood, is I'll get a list of the different teachers at the school and I'll just go through and ask them, is this which tell me which teacher is nice, tell me which teacher is mean, tell mm -hmm. me which teacher you don't have nothing to say. And I was surprised kindergarten, first grade, they could go through <laughs> and help me identify it like immediately. So I hear you saying a lot of things about talking and listening to people. Is that what it really comes down to that we just don't do? Bottom line, yes, spot up. I mean, look, here's the thing. I mean, we've had these conversations, you and I, for a long time about our children and these schools and teachers and administrators and the battles we've had to fight. But one of the things I love to do now whenever I go to schools, be it elementary, middle, or high school, is ask kids a simple question. Tell me who the good teachers are and tell me who the not so good teachers are. And they will rattle names off to you just like that. Even the young ones will tell you, you know what? She's mean, he's nice, people don't like her, he's okay, he treats the black students better, she can't stand black students. And sometimes these are second, third, fourth graders. So I think we have to listen to our children because our children are in it every day, they see it, they feel it, they know it. Uh, and I think that requires us also being present. You know, one of the things I always did when my children were in elementary school, my wife and I, I would show up unannounced. I just want to walk in when you don't know when I'm coming. I want to see what you're doing. I want to see what my kid is doing because see, you know, some of these teachers get very savvy. And I don't want to sound like I'm teacher bashing because a lot of teachers are doing a phenomenal job, but some of them are doing a lot of damage. We got to call a spade a spade. But I would love to walk in sometime and just to see what's the dynamics of the classroom. Where is my child sitting? Is he being encouraged? Is she being overlooked? And I think that we have to keep teachers accountable because if we don't, who else will? And I think the end of the day is the more we listen to our, our, our children and the more we sort of believe what they tell us, I think the better we get an insight in terms of what's really happening in schools all across this country. Got it. You know, as I was hearing you speak, one of the, the quotes that, that came to mind is something I've heard a, a colleague that I know you know, Andre Branch, um, mm -hmm. said, said to me. And we were at a point where we were looking for our own children at what would be a, a you know a good school to go to and and how to determine you know if it was a, a bad space and if it was going to be healthy enough for our kid and one of the the best words of advice I got from him is is to never leave your child in an unhealthy environment for the sake of a good school. That's right. A lot, a lot of times you're right. Folks will will bring their kids to what they think may be good schools and then ultimately they're in healthy environments and they do more damage than quote unquote, the school that they didn't think was good. That's right, that's right. I, had a, I have a colleague of mine, just two days ago, she and I had a conversation. She's got twin boys who are in high school. And she was explaining to me how she recognized that her, her boys have really different academic, social, emotional needs. So she said she put one of her sons in the neighborhood school uh, that's predominantly black and brown, but not seen or not as reputable as other schools are. And she put her other school in a more middle-class affluent school where it's predominantly white and Asian. And she says that she has watched the differences between the so-called better school and the not so good school. And she says overwhelmingly, she said her concerns are much greater with her son who's at the so-called better school because mm -hmm. the level of racial hostility, the level of exclusion, uh, and just her need to, as she said, keep my good eye on them is much greater there compared to the quote, not so much, the, not the, the not so good school, right? And I think that's what lots of parents are starting to recognize that, you know, I may have to help enhance some of the academic uh, sort of supports that the, the sort of the, the black and brown schools need, but by and large, I might feel comfortable with my son or my daughter in certain contexts and certain communities because there's a critical mass there. Uh, whereas the schools where there is not a critical mass, that's when black children tend to be even more ostracized and seen more through this deficit lens. And that's where we've got to be much more in tune with what they see and what they go through. And let's be frank, sometimes our, our kids, and this is, you know, you and I have had these conversations, Luke, because look, I've got four grown children now, right? And my kids will come to me now and tell me things that they went through years ago when they were in kindergarten, second grade, fourth grade, sixth grade, and it like infuriates me. I'm like, well, why didn't you come tell us all these things then? All race-based. 
And they said, after a while, you just get used to it. And just to hear that, that, that Black kids have to get used to the comments, the innuendos, the microaggressions, or the other thing, like one of my sons told me, he said, well, if I were to tell you when something was happening that was racial, I would have been telling you and mom something basically every single day because that's how often it occurred. And yeah. so I think our kids basically begin to adapt uh, and, and sort of become to uh, normalize these racist practices by peers and adults in ways that are just not healthy. And this is where, to your earlier point, us being present, us being visible, uh, and us being involved is, is, I think, one of the primary things that we can do to be advocates for our children. Well, one of the th things I wanted to ask you about is because there might be some people who are, are hearing this and saying to themselves that they want to do what's different, right? Mm -hmm. And you are an expert in so many different areas, but one of those areas is around exclusionary discipline, referrals, suspensions, expulsions. And I see that as having one of the most direct connections to what we are seeing with the BLM movement. So what can people do? What are some strategies that administrators, educators, counselors, professors, you do higher ed as, as well, like what are some things they can do to, to curb exclusionary discipline? Yeah, you know, what I find interesting on this, Luke, is the fact that I have watched, like I'm sure you have, and a lot of other folks have, are these different YouTube clips and videos that have come out that shows the different ways that white people interact with law enforcement compared to black folks. And yeah. I've watched video after video where I've seen white women and white men when having exchanges with law enforcement have this back and forth, uh, will be very verbally aggressive, uh, in some cases threatening, in some cases they will get out out of their cars and, and go up to police officers and tell them what they're not going to do and just talk to them in a very different way than black folks would ever be allowed to talk to law enforcement, right? And so there's like this double standard in the ways in which that, in, in ways that white folks can engage with law enforcement in terms of how they question them, refuse to comply, not always sort of acquiesce to, that, to, the, to the request of an officer in ways that, you know, we all have to talk with our children about what to do, what not to do if they come into contact with law enforcement. And I use that as an example to say the same thing happens in classroom, uh, where there's oftentimes a double standard where the ways in which many teachers interact with white children compared to black children is markedly different, right? So to those folks who would say, what can I do? I would ask them to first engage in some self-reflection on how do you see certain students compared to others? And do you really hold some students to the same standard as you do others? Because the kids see it all the time. Uh, who gets to participate? Who do you constantly reprimand? Who do you constantly send out of the classroom? Who are you telling time and time again to talk, to not talk, despite the fact that other students are talking? I think it comes down to teachers on the one hand, having to do some internal sort of assessment reflection uh, and some, some, some reckoning of sorts to say, do I really see black children uh, in ways that I, I, I may not want to publicly acknowledge, but privately I will say, if I look at the end of the day, I've only got three black, black kids in my classroom and all the names on my board of kids who are quote unquote problems are the three black kids, despite the fact that I got white kids who engage in similar behavior, but I give them time after time after time after time to adjust, something's wrong with that picture. Or I maintain as kids, to get older, middle school, high school, I think what teachers should do is engage in these anonymous surveys. Ask the students to write comments about what's working and what's what not working in their classroom. Don't put their names on it and have the students give you feedback because then you'll also get some data that tells you you can be better. So I think it starts with teachers in terms of who they send out and why they send them out. But then to me, Luke, the other part of this equation is that school leaders have to be better. School leaders have to say, look, and I've talked to enough school leaders who will tell you, I know when the students will be sent to my office. I know for what kind of minor infractions they'll be sent to my office. And I know what classroom they will come from. So I'm asking school leaders to start doing a couple of things. One, send those students back to class and say, you know what? I'm not gonna have this student in my office because he or she was two minutes late when I know kids walk in this class and in, in this school late all the time. Uh, if you notice that there are certain teachers who are repeatedly, and I mean repeatedly sending black and brown children to the office, then you've got to have a hard conversation with that particular teacher to say, I don't know what we can do to support you, but I can't have you constantly sending the same students to class every single solitary day when these same students don't seem to have any other problems with any other teacher other than your class. So instead of pointing the finger at the kids, 
what is it that this teacher is doing? So leaders have got to then provide support and some professional development or some training, or maybe you start having conversations with these teachers to say, this may not be the best fit for you because you apparently don't seem to understand these students. And then a third part of this, and you, you've you talked about this, you've written about this too, Luke, is that there's a cultural component to this as well, that the ways in which black children oftentimes show up culturally, oftentimes it's just misunderstood and mischaracterized by teachers. And therefore children are just coming to school, trying to be their authentic selves, but their ways of expression their ways of knowing, their ways of communicating, their ways of celebrating, their ways of laughing, their ways of being angry are seen through this, 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 this pathologized lens that says they're different, they're disobedient, they're defiant, and so therefore they must be punished. So we got to do some serious cultural um, um, supporting of, uh, of these teachers because they just are missing the boat in a major way, which causes lots of damage to our children. So I think there's some things that need to happen and at the at the classroom level, there's some things that need to happen at the leadership level. There's some things that need to happen at the at the training level. And then I think districts as a whole have got to start looking at these data across the board and say, why is it that certain schools are just so hell bent on consistently kicking black kids out? Uh, and like I said, oftentimes when you look at these data, it's not the entire school. Sometimes it's just a cluster of four or five teachers who are responsible for like 80% of the suspensions and expulsions. So I would again think that the teachers who are not engaged in that behavior. They should be trying to hold these folks accountable, give them support to say, you're giving me a bad rap and the school a bad rap because you don't know how to teach black and brown children. That's real. We have to have a better, do a better job of, of holding them accountable. And I definitely think you're right. The voice of the parents is part of it. The voice of the students is yep. part of it. But yep. ultimately the teachers have to also hold one another accountable. So you, you have this, this uh, quote up, a system cannot fail those it was never meant to protect. With that in mind, can we actually improve our schools to a point where they can begin to protect those that they were never designed for? Or what's the path? Yeah, man, that's the million dollar question, right? And this is one that I'll be frank with, I, I grapple with every single day because sometimes I, like you and lots of other folks, sit in these classrooms or sit in schools and listen to things that folks say. And I'm thinking, wow, I, I just would not be comfortable sending my children to this place if this is what these people believe and this is what they say. They say this to the adults. If they are bold enough to tell you that they see kids in a certain way, should we really be sending our most cherished possessions, our children, into their care? Uh, should we be giving them the kind of you know, uh, uh, authority to essentially take our children's minds and shape and mold them in ways that we know can be irreparably dam damaging at some point. So I think this is the question we have to ask ourselves. For the time being, I think we have to recognize that schools as we know them um, are the mechanism by which most of us have used to, to, to help our children become socialized and, and, and educated. But I think we have to begin to push for a way that we are, re are reimagining schools. I think this moment this BLM moment where we have seen folks saying, you know what, um, we're not just toppling statues, but we're, to we're toppling sort of systems of, of how uh, we operate. We are, we are rethinking um, some of our practices. We are rethinking you know, our policies. We're just trying to radically um, um, sort of reinvent, if you will, how we've always operated business as usual. And I think schools cannot be exempt from that. I think we have to radically try to think about how we reinvent schools. And that means, again, doing some of the things I've talked about earlier, looking at curriculum and saying that this is unacceptable, uh, being more involved in the teachers who teach our children, the leaders who lead those schools, the counselors who never seem to support our students, asking why there aren't essential supports in place like psychiatric social workers, uh, like mental health therapists. I just think it's gonna require a lot of intensity to say that the system has got to be better. Um, and for those who believe at the end of the day that it can't be better, I have no qualms with that. And there are many folks who are just tapping out, saying I can do better on my own. Uh, I can do better in an independent school. Uh, I, I can do better with homeschooling uh, because the data will, will, will tell in time that, you know what, my children do not have to be subjected to some of the kinds of hostility that they are in this place. And so this is the million dollar question we're all going to have to confront. I think we need to continue to keep the full core pressure on schools to do better, um, to act better, uh, to respond better. Uh, and then if they don't, I think we have to choose to walk and find what we think are better alternatives for our children. And that's what this uh, will come down to. 
Uh, I really appreciate um, those thoughts and those sentiments. As we close out, any any last words you want to leave folks with? Um, this is a this is a, a hard, challenging, difficult uphill battle. But I will say this, and 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 folks who are listening to this know this. This is not our first rodeo. Uh, our existence in these uh, United States of America has always been fraught with an upward battle for equality and for justice and for freedom. Um, we know that we come from a long line of folks who have always fought for us to be seen and heard. And I think we have to draw strength. We have to draw inspiration. Uh, we have to draw ideas from those who have come before us because they have oftentimes provided us with blueprints of how we fight against racist organizations. They have given us tools and strategies of how we continue to sort of undermine some of the very policies and practices that were never designed for us in the first place. And so I think these forums, such as what you provided here, Luke, uh, are another example for us to talk about it, to share resources, to talk about best practices, to talk about ways we rethink not just K-12 institutions, but as you know, both you and I uh, see a lot of this playing itself out at the higher education level where they're even more entrenched than the ideologies and the practices. So we have to continue to keep the pressure on, continue to not let folks uh, off the mat. Uh, I think in this moment of BLM, uh, I think it's provided a window, but I just hope that we don't peter out in this window, that we have to continue to see what the bigger picture is. Our kids are expecting us needing us, demanding us to be advocates for them. And I just don't think we have the the, the ability or should we have the, the will to let them down. Well, that's real. Thank you so much for, for joining us again. This is your, your, your second time doing this. We really appreciate it. We know your time is precious and and um, good luck with all the work that you're you're doing, the great work you're doing. I appreciate you, man. I'm just trying to keep up with you. You're doing all the great work. And again, I appreciate you and Professor Ford for, for being the leaders in, in this important work. And uh, let's keep it going. Thanks for having me. All right. Thank you. Have a good one. I'm a PhD student at San Diego State University. Today, I'm out here at the George Floyd site where George Floyd was murdered by Minneapolis police. I'm also speaking with community members about their experiences in education and how black minds and black lives are linked. And what's your name? Serena. I'm Tyler Gibbs. My name is Janice Bigger. Sean Reynolds. My name is Orvie B. Baker, Jr. Well, right now, you know, we're on 38th and, 38th in Chicago. You know, we're right here on the site where George Floyd was murdered. And uh, I'm sitting right here talking to the brother Muhammad, you know, letting him know, like, right now, today, we're focused on a bigger issue than, you know, things that happened in the past, you know, because justice has not been served. Just because of the officers was locked up, they're still not prosecuting and found guilty. So we're going to continue to do what we do and stay positive and protest in a peaceful manner. We need to stop the violence. We need to help our young brothers, give them opportunities to open up resource centers. We need to have economics, you know, places where they can go and get the help that they need because a lot of brothers don't have that right now. I had that when I was growing up, but we need that now. I did not experience any discrimination or being treated differently. It was actually quite an incredible experience that I had with teachers that actually cared about me, that did not look uh, at me and see less than. They saw each and every single student as worthy of an amazing education, and they poured their heart and souls. My college experience was very different because I went to a predominantly uh, Caucasian university, and my professors were still encouraging. Um, I was a track and field athlete. I was one of the probably, I would say maybe one of like 10 or maybe 12 students of color that were also athletes at the school there. And we were we were celebrated. You know, there's a phrase that I just want to encourage you to walk with is that uh, people go where they are celebrated, not where they're tolerated. So if you're feeling like you're being tolerated in a place that you're at, you don't have to live in that. You want to be around people who celebrate you, who see your qualities that you have, who see the character that you have, and they encourage that. My experience with K-12, I used to face this thing. You know what I'm saying? I don't think I was really a bad kid. You know, I was just me, you know what I mean? Sometimes people did get in trouble, but you know what I'm saying? I, was, I definitely got more than everybody. I went to all, mostly all black school, of course, and stuff, mostly all white teachers. 
and you know that's just the way it was back then we were treated okay i mean it wasn't the best you know how we see some kids have been treated and stuff the teachers kind of taught a little bit i kind of remember that um you know if we did have the little white kids in our class you know they they always went to them all the time and me being a light-skinned black person i noticed that i got chosen a lot also too. I don't want to say I had a better advantage than what they did because I was a light-skinned uh, black person and stuff, but I would say yes. I, I think I was treated a lot better than, than some of them. So I just, you know, I, I hate to say that, but I do. Never really felt that I was mistreated. Um, even in high school, never felt I was mistreated. When I went to um, City College and New York City Tech, didn't feel that I was mistreated. But in the light of certain events, I feel that our culture, my culture, wasn't expressed uh, even in African-American studies. The change that we need to see, we need to be that change. My children were fortunate enough to go to that school, right, um, and get um, some of the mentoring that I got from teachers in that school. Some of the same teachers that were there when I went to school were still there. Although I can't relate with my kids experiencing that, my heart does go out to those individuals, and I do understand that it does happen. My first day in the 11th grade, I had my English lit teacher who basically told me that I had to work extremely hard in order to enter her room. Um, she basically met me at the door. Why me of all people? I haven't the slightest idea, but that basically just put a sour taste in my mouth and probably was one of my earlier uh, memories of being profiled or basically make you stand out due to the color of my skin. I was truly disappointed, but it also gave me the sense of and the drive to work harder in a class. So I received an A. So, I mean, it, it was perfect. I started out school in Chicago, so uh, I never had to question my worth, my blackness. If anything, I had to come up to the standard of what being from the South Side of Chicago meant in school from 1970 to 78. While I had some teachers that lauded me and wanted me to pursue everything I could. I had a few teachers tell me that I would be nothing more than, and I quote this one math teacher, a garbage man. The way out is education. Uh, I grew up on the South Side of Chicago, it's poor. I moved to Louisiana. That's a whole nother level of poor, but the two things that tie the poor side to moving up, like Georgia Weezy, is education. Teachers from the fifth grade, from the eighth grade, and they had no idea of the effect they had on my life today. Most educators really want us to succeed, and that's regardless of the color, black or white. Now, speaking as black American, um, I've noticed a lot of teachers that I'm still friends with today that really wanted me to achieve higher levels, especially because I was a black kid growing up. All right, everyone, we are very, very privileged today to have Shante Needham with us. Shante is Sandra Bland's sister. And as you know, Shante, the, the focus of this class is on drawing parallels between what we see with policing and how we see similar patterns in education. But before we get there, we would like to know what was Sandra like growing up? What was her life like? What were some of her gifts and talents. We'd just love to hear more about her from you. Sandy was a very happy kid going up, growing up. Um, she loved reading until the day of her demise. She was always reading something um, pertaining to being educated on our um, race and our background. And she would love to clean. She loved to cook. Her specialty was red, bean, uh, red beans and rice and dirty rice. She loved to um, participate in sport. All any after school activity that they had, Sandy was in it. Um, she was just a beautiful soul. And um, I truly do miss her. We really wanted to have you as part of Black Minds Matter because, you know, as you said, you miss her. And unfortunately, her, um, what happened to her 
really has had an impact on the nation. And that's not how we want our you know, people to um, be. So thank you again for taking this time with us and then sharing more um, about her that others just wouldn't know. Yeah. Um, I, I also, I meant to do this at the beginning, but I thank you all for allowing me the opportunity to even um, engage in such a conversation that is so necessary. Um, but yeah, I do think that sometimes strong women are we are misunderstood. And I, I think we have to get to a place where um, women matter and they value our human life just as a whole. Um, hopefully one day we can get to that space. Let um, me just pray for uh, better days. Yeah. So you mentioned a little bit about it, but what was, and you, you say Sandy, is it what you prefer we say Sandy or Sandra? What's the, what's the most appropriate? <laughs> well, Sandy is the name that the family uses. Okay, that's a family name. Okay, so Sandra. <laughs> What was, um, so what was Sandra like in school? You you were mentioned a little bit about this. You said she always had her, her head in a book, but tell us more. What, what was it like? So my mom moved us from um, the west side of Chicago to the suburbs when we were younger. And so we went to a predominantly Asian um, <laughs> high school. Um, so it was... It was a little different because I think our ratio was extremely low. Um, it was very difficult at times just trying to figure out how to engage mm -hmm. with the Caucasian um, race because it was maybe like 80% Caucasian at the high school we went to. But at any rate, Sandy learned how to um, intermingle with them. He was on everything. I mean, volleyball, tennis, basketball, Girl Scouts, um, badminton. <laughs> she was on everything. And oftentimes she was only the, um, the only Black person on the team. So I think, mm -hmm. I'm sorry, is go ahead. Young, is she younger than you, older? Yes, I'm the oldest. Um, she would have been, she would have been 33 in February. Um, mm -hmm. So she always had us at some type of <laughs> event at school. Um, needless to say, she graduated. She got a four-year scholarship to Prairie View, a band scholarship at that. Mm. She was one of the best trombone players um, that they had ever seen. So that's how she even ended up at Prairie View. Um, I think the first year, it was a bit challenging for her, you know, because she was gone away from us. And it was five girls. So just imagine um, just being gone from your sisters. But my sister and I, my mom, we helped her as much as we could, you know, made sure she can come home whenever she um, needed to. But she liked it of Prairie View. Um, she, she just loved the place, <laughs> which is why she even went back down that road to go back there to help the younger generation with whatever it is that she could do to be able to come back. People don't understand our minds and they don't understand our dynamics and how we deal with things. And oftentimes that's why we are sometimes left behind and misunderstood and um, categorized as being or um, rude, so to speak. I think if they just take the time, people just as a whole, just take the time to get to know us and understand us, um, I, I think we could really move forward with what it is that we're trying to do because the black mind is so important and it's so precious. And I, I think it's a terrible thing to be wasted, especially in, in a time such as this. Read. So, so with this class, one of the things that we're trying to do is, again, to draw those parallels between what we see in policing and what we see in education. What, what are some of the, the good things and 
and the bad things that you've seen in education and, and any takeaways that you think the teachers, educators, counselors, anybody who works in the field of education, whether it's a high school, university, what do you think folks need to know? I've noticed that because my myself, I have four children and I moved them from the city of Chicago as well um, because I, I was noticing that their teaching um, structure is extremely different from the suburban structure, right? And so I did not want my kids to be left behind. Um, that was one part, but the other part was the violence was just outrageous. And I did not want to raise my African-American sons in the city of Chicago. We moved out to the suburbs and I realized that my kids were behind, severely. They had been in Chicago public schools for um, about six to seven years before we actually moved to the suburbs. And it took some time, it took tutoring, and they finally got to the speed that they needed to be at, but it was a disservice from CPS. Honestly, I'm sorry, but it was just a disservice to my kids that they, they when they when we moved to the suburbs, to the suburbs, they didn't, they was like, their reading was so behind. But God is good, and they made it. Um, my younger son, however, he had been in CPS for only a few years. Uh, and then when we moved to the suburbs, they ran some tests on him and found out that he had IEP. And so what I appreciated about them was they didn't just push him along. They helped me right there in that moment with all of the resources that were available. And now he's doing much better. I'm very appreciative of that um, because they could have just left him and and just you know sometimes school just pass you along and knowing that you are not ready to be passed along to the next grade. I appreciate that. But I do think oftentimes I think sometimes the 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 overload is so overwhelming that it's kind of hard for teachers to I guess channel in with everyone and, and make sure that everyone is possibly on the same level going forward. Well, it's definitely disappointing to know that that in this case, you know, one school district, which I'm familiar with Chicago, um, failed, you think, and you have a right to think that, all right? Nobody can negate that. Nobody can say you're wrong, but failed your children and that you, you felt compelled and then followed up on that. To move your to move to a suburb, and then it's another whammy where your children, Miss Needham, where your children, Shante, were underprepared, and then you had to you know devote whatever resources you had to catch them up. But too many families don't have that opportunity, which is another thing that goes to Black Minds Matter. Your children were capable when they were in Chicago. And then you saw the capability when, uh, more so when they got tenure uh, uh, tutoring and, you know, in another school district. You might have saw that also if you had tutoring in Chicago school district. But uh, it's, it's a shame that you had to go from urban area to a suburban area to get what you needed um for your children i mean it's very disappointing to hear that it, it is but i i also think too that the urban area needs a lot of resources and they are not being given the proper uh, resources that are needed to make sure that our kids succeed um they spend so much time on strikes and i get it you know they they want their money, but also the kids are being disserviced in that same moment that you are striking. 
And then it's taking resources away from what could be very well helping them succeed in life. Um, I'm not going to blame it all on the schools um, because the parents, they have a, uh, um, they have some responsibility as well. Thank you. <laughs> I'm over here. My mind is like everywhere. Um, I saw you looking for an R word. <laughs> It, but yeah, it's it's just I think it, it too falls with uh, when we vote, voting for these elected officials, we have to make sure that they're doing what they said that they were going to do when they get in the office. Like we need resources. So if you say you're going to give us resources, then we're going to hold you to that. And if you do not give us those resources that you said you would when you wanted our vote, we're going to have to vote you out. But, but we need more resources in the urban areas. We need more economic development in our urban areas. Because when I go to Chicago, sometimes I just be so bad. I see everybody with their pants hanging. You see drugs on the ground. You just see young kids cussing, being very disrespectful. And I'm just like, oh my God, what is going on? But what can we do to help this younger generation? Because if we don't do something quick and drastically, those wonderful minds are going to go to waste. And we never know, these kids could just need a little bit of push, just a, and their minds could just, they could be the next judge, doctor, lawyer, governor, mayor. But we have to train the mind and get the mind on a, on a, steady pace of moving forward and not backward so so i'm interested in this what what was the difference in terms of the teachers right and that you experienced in chicago there versus when you moved to the suburb was there a difference in terms of how they engage were they more invested in the students were they taking more time i mean what what was what was the difference for you so the teachers in the suburbs actually absolutely are more engaged um they were even that way when we were younger. Urban teachers are, they're a little more engaged. I had one incident where my son had an, um, he had an, an issue with the teacher. It was a, she had made a little racist joke and thought it was funny. She didn't know that his mom cared. And I had to go and address that. But otherwise, as far as like teaching them, they gave them the resources that was needed and made sure that they did, made sure that they would be able to meet the goals, I guess, of the district. Whereas when they were attending schools in CPS district, I just think they're overwhelmed and they overworked. So they didn't put as much effort into making sure that our kids move forward so how is your personality different from your sister well actually we quite the same <laughs> in some instances um i'm very bold and unapologetic just like she was um i speak my mind um i'm strong i've never been the type of place for us because that just was not my thing i love school though um I was very adamant about things that I wanted and needed. Whereas Sandy, she would speak her mind and wouldn't care how you felt. Sometimes I feel that way, but I also am very cautious of the words that come out of my mouth because you cannot bring the word, you can't take the words back. So I care about how people feel most of the time when I'm trying to get the point across. <laughs> But she's half of the reason why I started my locks. Um, I, I was like short hair, bald hair for like 17 years. And she was starting her lock process. And she said, come on, sister, come come on. And I said, oh, no, honey. It's going to be so ugly on me. Yeah. And she was like, no, come on, come on. And so I didn't do it um, while she was here. But about two years ago, I started to dye my hair. And it fell out. It was coming out in my hand. I say, oh, okay, Sandy. Let me put these locks in my head. Yeah, look at oh, 
Huh? I said, look at this right here. I, and that was my color, ball head. So now I got locks. And I'm sure she's in heaven smiling because I stayed the course. And actually, I look beautiful. I like it. You do. You <laughs> Thank you. Um, but I miss her, you know. I had a moment this morning. Um, I really believe that today was the actual day that she was passed away because my body was hurting so bad. It was just in so much pain. Um, and so I had a moment this morning, but I'm better right now. I don't know how I'm gonna be after this interview, but I'm better right now. We appreciate that. We know that this this has to take um, a lot out of you. So we, we're very grateful for you taking your time to, to talk with us. Um, so Donna, is there another question that you had that you wanted to ask or do you want me to go? Oh, I'm sorry, I put myself on mute. Um, you can go ahead, Luke. Okay. So I, I would love to hear a little bit more about what you think where you think things should go um, as it relates to both what we see in policing and what we see in education. Like what, have you had recommendations that you thought people really needed to hear, that, that people needed to take to heart and to do something different? What, what, what would those be? Hmm. I think we first need to figure out how we get rid of systemic racism because I think that plays a part, no, let me retract that. I know that plays a huge part in the way we are being policed as well as education. I think once we begin to um, decrease the amount of systemic racism that is very apparent in policing and education, I think then we can begin to move forward and um, see and or create change. Mm -hmm. Systemic racism is real, and I think when our counterparts begin to understand that and have those very uncomfortable conversations that they are avoiding having, I think we can start moving forward. But we need their help too um, to move forward, yeah. and, and so that we can um, again be valued, our human life be valued and our human minds as well. Um, because sometimes when all of this stuff is going on, it, it plays on the mind and it has you thinking and, and overthinking and just sometimes wondering what's gonna happen next or what should I do next? What can I do next? Um, so, so first we need to tackle that, that's for sure, both areas. Yeah. Um, I should have said, asked this question earlier, so I apologize. Um, I really apologize. So when you hear about all this sh shit, this racist shit, I just got to say. Okay, um, then. <laughs> let's be real. Yes. On in terms of George Floyd and others, I mean, he was a tipping point. How do you deal with every time you hear a, a now, now I'm getting heated up. Ooh, a murder taking place. Um, do you have flashbacks or, I mean, how do you cope? And I'm not saying you over it. I'm just saying, how do you not go over the edge that day or the next day? And think about your four uh, children who you said were adults or whatever. I mean, it it's happening daily, but... Uh, some that make the news like your sister and it, George Floyd. How do you cope? It absolutely re-triggers me um, on so many different levels, like the George Floyd um, murder. It, I never watched the video, and I will never watch the video. However, I did see, I, I when I woke up that morning, I had saw, um, I saw a picture of the officer's knee on his neck. And immediately I went into a prayer because in that moment, I saw the officer's knee on my sister's back. And I was just 
oh my God, his family has to be enraged right now. Um, so I went into a prayer and I really just threw the phone because I didn't want to watch the video. And I was just outraged that four, well, almost five years later, we're, we're still seeing the same thing. At what point will the officers be held accountable? And when I say accountable, I mean, no more paid administrative leave, no more being able to keep their pensions. I mean, being terminated <laughs> from the job or being arrested. And I mean, having the right crime fit the sentencing as well. Um, we can never begin to heal as a nation until the police start beginning to be held accountable for their actions and these murders that they're doing. And yeah. it's, it's just really sad that we can't heal because now here comes someone else. And you're right, some of them, like I'm, I'm, I'm in this group, uh, Families United for Justice, and some of these people, their stories never got like what you said, like my sister did. And it's so many families where the police have killed their loved one and they are getting away with it. And it's sad. And also, too, I know you probably like, oh, my gosh, keep saying this, but voting <laughs> is power. We have to have the right people in those elected spaces to help us. And, and we have to hold them accountable as well. Until we until those two things happen we're not going to see any change. So I'm, I'm curious, Shante, Shante, we talked about your sister with mm -hmm. all due respect, and we must. I want to talk about you. I mean, let, let, what do you do? I mean, I know you said you have both children, but... <laughs> so I, I work for a Fortune 500 company. Um, okay. Okay. <laughs> I, I work. I mean, sounds like you're being modest. <laughs> I, I work for a Fortune 500 company. Or I do. We can skip this, but um, you're human, and we want to humanize you. I, I oh, want to talk about you. I am a 40 year old African American woman. I am going back to school for my undergrad for human resources. I've been in my company eight years, and I, I think it's just time to move up. Um, so I'm going to school to get the little paper that they want me to have in order to move up. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, I am, I have my own clothing brand, No Queen Left Behind. Um, it was arrived November the 14th of 2018. And originally it was like, my sister always greeted everyone with king and queen, king and queen, king and queen, king and queen. So one day I was just sitting up and I said, no queen left behind. And it's twofold. So the first part is when one of your sisters or brothers elevate, you know, when, as we elevate, we bring our sisters and brothers along with us. Don't leave them behind. Share that knowledge with them so that they know what we know so that we all can excel, right? And then the second part to it is our loved ones are not here to speak for themselves or defend themselves. So we cannot leave them behind. We have to bring them with us. We have to keep their legacy going and continue to let people know who our loved one is. Um, yeah. No one, no one will go to bat for your loved one harder than you. So it's on you to continue to keep their legacies going. And basically that's where the no queen um, left behind came from and I came out with king no king no prince no princess left behind as well um so so that's what I do in my spare time outside of just being a family person I love hosting um dinners and stuff for the family game night and just trying to be very involved in my kids lives even though even though they're grown I still try to guide them in the way that they need to be added in. Um, and just being an activist is hard at times, trying to just balance everything because when a family reaches out and they're like, you know, we, we need you, 
I have to push back my tears and put my strong face on and, and go and support these families. Um, I try to support as many as I can, but sometimes I also have to exercise self-care because if I do not, then mentally and emotionally, I will. Um, so I do protest when I can. I absolutely try to make as many family um, visuals or candlelights or remembrance celebrations that I can, but I also have to, to take, make sure I take care of my mind because some, sometimes it, it's a bit much. It's very overwhelming um, just hearing the stories and how the police keep getting away with it. It's, it's just very sad at times. But I am human and I do I do smile. I always say I'm smiling through the pain um, because it will be five years tomorrow and we still don't really know what happened to my sister. So sometimes that can be a bit much, um, but, but I'm maintaining. I do see a therapist because I think therapy is, is real and I think it's okay to see a therapist. Um, so that, that works and, and that's, that's me. Well, that's a phrase, smiling through the pain. Yeah, I'm going to put that on the shirt one day. You better you put on the shirt one day. Smiling through the pain. And it's yes. so agonizing. Um, you, your sister's murder, I'm sorry, I have to use that word, okay? Yes, ma'am. National news, but there's so many others who didn't. And so this, what you're sharing with us is, I believe, going to help other people um Shante, can i ask a question real quick? Better. You, Absolutely. you you you've mentioned you mentioned aspects of your faith a couple of times here how, do, how does that play a role in in your ability to keep moving forward so i'm not even gonna lie to you um when my sister first passed i was so angry with god I was like, it's several people on this earth you could have took. And you took my sister, my 28-year-old sister. I did not go to church. I was not praying. I was not tithing. I was not doing anything related with God. And when people would say to me anything about God, I would get so upset and tell them, I want to hit it. Get away from me. It was like, literally for like two and a half years. I'm not going to lie to you. But in the midst of all of that, I had my prayer warriors that were still praying for me because they know, I guess they understood where I was coming from. Um, so one day, I just looked up and I looked up to the skies and I said, you know what, God? And I'm sorry. Can you accept my apology, please? And because I know that. I know that you have been there through my rough times. So I know that you're going to bring me thus far. And I also understand that we are all on borrowed time and that my sister's work was done in that moment. So I had a hallelujah moment with God. Um, and then just moving forward, I prayed, reading my Bible. That helps a lot. And just listening to that worship music, it really does help um, with just trying to deal with life in itself because life is already hard and when you have added extra baggage um it makes it that much more hard so but god god is real and i think he understands and, and it's okay for us to be mad with god and it's okay for us to talk to god in the manner that we choose to talk to him in but ultimately god is forgiving and um i'm just thankful for his grace and mercy but yes God, uh, my spirit is definitely uplifted. Sometimes, I'm not going to lie to you, I'm not always smiling, but I do try to smile as much as I can because I know that my sister wouldn't want it any other way. She would want us to be able to fight and keep her legacy going and create change because that's what she wanted to do. She said, I'm here to change history. And I believe that that's what she's doing. Um, it, it could be small things, big things, but I celebrate all victories because all victories count. 
Well, as I'm looking at you, uh, it's been a while. You look so much, y'all look so much alike. <laughs> Everybody say that. I <laughs> mean, I'm like, who, I am got the lock. <laughs> to, and it's like, who am I talking to? Y'all look so much alike. And I'm like, oh my goodness. <laughs> I really, really, really do. And then listening to what you have to share, it's just, um, I don't know what words to put to it. And yeah. I we talk about, people talk about Black Lives Matter, um, but they and but they tend not to as much talk about say her name. Oh, that part right there. Oh. <laughs> oh. oh no! What did I just say? <laughs> Go ahead. It, it's it's so important to say her name, and don't get me wrong. I'm absolutely outraged at what's going on with our Black men and boys as well. However, they seem to sweep the Black girls and Black women away. We can't do that. We have to include them because we are the group, right? Black women and girls are the group. And I, I think we have to push and, and continue to say their names because if we do not, then they'll just become a mystery. Like even, even now it's been five years, each time someone reaches out and want to humanize my sister, I get elated because that lets me know that people are still saying her name, mm -hmm. that her legacy is still moving forward. But we also have to do that for the other girls and women, black girls and women, who did not get that exposure. So oftentimes what I will do is either I'll mention some of the names or um, when I just came from Texas doing a protest last March, I had several of their names on the front and back of my shirt. And people were like, oh my God, who are those women? Oh, the police killed them, either by a gun or a car or they died in police custody. We just have to continue to bring awareness to our Black queens and our Black princesses because yeah. it's real. It's real. And if we do not do it, trust me, no one else is going to do it. Well, I, I, I appreciate you saying that and hope, again, that it didn't cause, you know, some more, you know, pain. No, you. no, no, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> her name say her name and and actually my other sister she is she is in that movement um the say her name movement the the woman who created it she's in that group and i was like wow that's amazing you know to just be there but it's it's so much deeper she said than people just saying her name you have to really put that power in it and say their names and make sure that maybe we won't have to say another name, another name. if we can just get rid of this systemic racism. And also these, these police, they need to have some culture sensitivity training. And I mean, not five minutes, I mean some in-depth culture sensitivity training because they should know how to deal with black woman girl you should not be threatened by a black woman or girl because they know their rights or because they speak eloquently or because they know that what you're doing is wrong you, you shouldn't lose your life for that you should not go into jail in handcuffs and come out in a body bag you should not be standing out with your friends and the police gets to shooting all the way from a whole nother direction and you get killed. You should not be in a car and the police should kill you. you, you these are things that should not be occurring. You should, your job, the police job is to serve and protect. And that's what they should be doing. And in schools too, with these resource officers. Yes. Yes. Because I've seen things on I don't know if they they real or not but I've seen some things that absolutely blows my mind um like with the resource officer that had the altercation with the girl in school where he threw her over the desk threw her all on the floor and yep. I was like oh my god this is crazy 
but it's, it's all a part of the mind. That systemic racism, we have to get rid of that because in their minds, they have to be thinking that we're still slaves. They have to be thinking that they're more superior than us when at the end of the day, if they check the facts, Black people is power. Yeah. I, I think each time that I'm able to empower anyone, even if it's just one person, then I know that my sister is smiling. Um, all the time, people don't agree. Sometimes people don't agree with what I say, but most of the time people understand and can relate to what it is that I'm saying. So I hope that I was able to help at least just one person, if not two, three, four, five, six, and so on. But this definitely helped me and I am grateful for being able to be um, included in such a wonderful um, panel, Black Minds Matter. And we have to continue to say that Black Minds Matter and also prepare the minds um, so that they matter to us too. You know, and, and just taking care of our minds, um, nurturing the mind actually, we need to do. And then just move forward and, and work together. Unity is gonna be the answer because all of this division, we will not move forward with all of this division. If we all have one common goal, Oh, which is the black mind matter, then let's work toward it and make sure that it matters and it counts. Well, with that, we just want to thank you so much for sharing your time with us. No problem. I thank you all and have a wonderfully blessed day. You too. Thank you so much. Well, that was in a um, very enlightening, enlightening interview. Um, we just want to um, thank Shantae again for um, expressing her opinion, her opinion, her perspectives, and, and of course, her experiences with her sister, Sandra Bland. And um, again, uh, Shantae is uh, doing Black Minds t-shirts. So if you want to support her and the work that she's doing, again, go to No Queen Left Behind and you can um, order those t-shirts. Now, what we're going to do in terms of engagement is a little bit different than we've done in years past. So what we are going to do is that we are going to engage our participants uh, primarily via Twitter. So if you have questions, if you heard something from one of the speakers, if you want to know something about um, the mini lecture that I gave and the mini lecture that Dr. Ford gave, then what we would like you to do is to use Twitter, hashtag Black Minds Matter, you see our respective Twitter handles, and to post your questions to us. We will either respond to your questions via our own phones, or we will also take a select grouping of those questions and do a recorded response that we will release each Monday where we talk about um, and talk through some of the questions that you have posed. So we encourage you to engage us in that way during this time. And we just want to thank you for attending this first session and just conclude by saying that Black Lives Matter and Black Minds Matter. Thank you, and we will see you next week. <laughs>